Not every day you get a chance to talk to someone who has summited Mount Everest. An amazing, an amazing story. And before I introduce Eric Alexander to you, take a look at this. It's exciting, but it's a uh, discipline to keep your mind focused and, and positive and not just sort of doubting, doubting what you're going to do. The summit, Faith Beyond the Everest Death Zone. Eric, uh, welcome. You know, I, I, I want to start uh, uh, right at the back of your book. I want to quote you here. Uh, in two, two separate paragraphs, first of all, you say, what does it take to persevere? You'll never take one step if you're indifferent toward climbing a mountain, and you shouldn't. You have to want the summit, want the experience, want the misery, and desire the joy of hard work that will make it possible. And then you say in the next uh, paragraph, when it comes to the pursuit of dreams, there are most definitely two types of people in this world, those who do and those who doubt. And you say the biggest difference between the two is right there in the spelling. Do is doubt without the B-U-T. I would do it, but, and people, we, you know, all of us are doing this all of the time. I, you know, I'd like to do this, but. What was the but for you? when you thought about leading a blind man up Everest. Oh. Yeah, I guess I found myself on both sides of that. I found myself as a doer and have definitely found myself as a doubter. Uh, I was certainly having my fear and my doubts as this climb for Everest was coming towards me. I had just lost my best friend. I had yeah. just had a nearly fatal accident the year before. Yeah, falling down a mountain. Falling off the And then you had hate, peak. high altitude <laughs> pulmonary, pulmonary edema. Edema, that's right. And so I had plenty of butts yeah. going through my mind as I'm thinking, you know, can I, can I go and do this? But, you know, largely it was fear that was trying to get a grip on me. And uh, the Lord doesn't want us to live in that place. And so I thought I would, I would give it to him. And I started to pray my way through it, hoping that he would close doors on me as I was pushing on them, you know, and just affirming me in my fear, saying, oh, yep, okay, tried that, prayed about it, nope, not going to go. But as I pressed on those, every single one of these doors where I had my doubts opened up. And, you know, me climbing Everest wasn't about me standing on the summit. And God never said, I'm going to place you on top of this mountain. This is my will for you. Instead, I, I felt that he was saying, my will for you is to trust me and to take a step of faith. And that's more what this is about. Now, spe speaking of taking a step of faith, Eric uh, Weinmayer, who uh, is the blind man who climbed with you, took several steps of faith. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us how you guided it. First of all, he, he asked you to come along, right? He did. And, and how did that come about? How, did you know him from before, or did he know you by reputation? Uh, well, I'd known him for a few years, but I, was actually, I had a roommate who was in a wheelchair, and they were at a disabled ski conference, and Eric came and crashed on my couch, and we started talking about climbing, and he said, oh, I climb, and I've done this and that, and I kind of thought, yeah, and I'm not so sure. I'd guided blind skiers before, and I knew what uh, people were capable of, but I, I was still had my doubts, and so we went out and climbed some vertical ice in Vail, where I live, and I found out r rather quickly that he's a very capable climber. And so as our friendship grew, we did climbs around Colorado and different places, and then we were up high on a peak, and he said, hey, I'm putting a team together for Everest. Would you want to come and be a part of that? And my heart about leapt out of my chest. But uh, we started off on a training climb in the Himalayas with Everest as the objective for the year after. So as I got to know him, I realized how capable he was, and I really wanted to support him in this dream because I saw the possibilities and uh, not the impossibilities. What was the name of the mountain where you fell? 
It was called Ahmed Ablam. Right. I, you know, I was trying to pronounce it as a reading. I said, I can't figure it. I'll ask him. Ahmed Ablam. Yep. Now, I found it interesting that after that fall and, and after you got back to the States, a lot of your self-doubt related to that fall. Mm -hmm. But it, it wasn't your fault. I mean, you're, sta you're standing on a, on, a, on, a, on a rock and it shifted. You, you couldn't have anticipated or have known it would shift. And the next thing you know, you're falling 150 feet. And yet this really impacted you in terms of, do I have what it takes to, to even uh, presume to climb Everest? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I think really for me, it was just the fact that I was the, one of the guys responsible for leading someone who's blind. It would have been harder for me had he been the one that had fallen, but it would also be more likely that he would be the one to fall. You know, if I'm looking over my shoulder and I say, step left, and ah, no, yeah. I'm sorry, I meant right. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. that, that, that you could understand that yeah. could happen, but yeah. I should be more cautious. I, I should look at these things. I should, you know, I'm carrying a double load. I just spent a week at 20,000 feet on a ledge with only my blind friend, and I get down and I'm just completely wiped out. And so... I kind of just maybe lost myself for that moment, stepped on that rock, it turned over, I fell 150 vertical feet uh, with the good fortune of bouncing off a few rocks on the way down. That, that's good fortune, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it slowed me down. But I didn't break any bones, and, uh, but I did get pulmonary edema, and that really just, I, I felt like a letdown, that I let my teammate down and my team members, and I thought, you know, it's a training climb, why would they want me back for Everest? But, in uh, facing those fears and doubts the next year, also the loss of my best friend, mm. I, I prayed about it. And one thing I'll never forget is when I asked Eric his response to me. And he said, you know, being blind, my whole life people have made judgments about me, what I can and what I can't do. I'm not about to do that same thing to you. You've got to decide for yourself. And I went, oh. Yeah, you wanted, him, you wanted him to decide. You, I want, yeah. You, in the book, you say you wanted other people to decide. You didn't want to make that decision. I didn't want to make that decision. I was just hoping he would rationalize through it and say, you know, you, you gave it your best, but you're more likely to get sick again and probably shouldn't have you on the team. But he said, you know, you're, you're a valuable part of this team, and I want you back. And the thing that struck me as you were describing this team business is how absolutely vital every team member is and how it's really true that you're only as strong as your weakest link. Mm -hmm. uh, it, one, one or two team members uh, fail and the whole, the whole thing can come apart, right? Mm -hmm. People were quick to say our weakest link was a person who's blind. Right. But believe it or not, that was our strength oh. because that was the central point that we could all have a focus. And it took the focus off of ourselves and our own egos and our own pride and all of these other things. And it allowed us to maximize our individual strengths and gifts for the, the good of the team. It's a lot like the body of Christ. You know, we all have a, a part and a role to play, but if we're not focused, we're gonna wander off in different directions, but that enabled us to, to come together around this uh, central focus and put our attention on him. And what seemed to be the weakest link actually became our greatest strength.